Thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry this is the low point of my jet -right existence. Um, so it's very possible I may fall asleep in the middle of this talk. Um, I managed to, Andrew Morton's talk was at the same time uh, yesterday, and I fell asleep in his. So uh, if I fall asleep on stage, somebody just come and give me a gig and, and, and we'll keep going. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say is, uh, please don't feel shy, don't feel you have to wait until any time at the end to put your hand up and ask questions. Um, if you see something that you think is incorrect or you just want to ask a question about anything, um, please feel free at any time to raise your hands and just you know, ask something. I'll repeat the question if you don't have a mic so that the people at the mic will be able to hear. Um, and also there are, I think, a couple of people in this room who know far more about some of the internal parts of Santa than I do. So, um, at least I know one of them is in this room. Um, so if I get a really difficult question, I may have to hand it on to my colleague, Volker Lendecki here, who's uh, sat down at the front coding new parts of Samba as, as I stand up here talking about it. Uh, so by the time I finish my talk, he may check something in that makes my talk obsolete. Um, but that's just the way it goes. So, uh, I like to think of Samba as an incredibly ugly uh, three-legged kitchen stool. Uh, you have no idea how long it took me to work out how to extrude cylinders in open office and, and create that graphic. It's, it's probably the most impressive graphic in the conference, I think. Anyway, um, so the, the three legs of Samba that I'm going to talk about that, that really are what makes it an interesting product and, and make it the interoperability glue that fits between Windows and, and Unix are the basic file service, which to be honest is the bit that I tend to spend most of my time on and I enjoy. Um, it, it's kind of like, it's a bit like woodworking. It, in the file service, it mostly works, but it's kind of like polishing that last piece of wood. You just want to get it perfect and, you know, as you do it, you realize you've chipped another piece off and you have to recarve parts of it. Um, the other part is authentication, which is incredibly important and becoming more important uh, as we look towards Samba 4 and Active Directory domain authentication, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, also, authentication covers um, the piece that we have, what I call Samba's secret weapon, which is what allows us to provide a single sign-on environment um, in Windows networks, to put Linux and Unix servers into Windows networks. And the ugly part of the stool um, is the print service, which is a nightmare beyond human imagining. Um, and we think we have pretty much working, um, and I'm going to talk as little as possible about that. Um, but unfortunately, I do bear responsibility for large parts of that code. So if you have any particular questions, uh, feel free to stick your hand up and I'll pretend I've forgotten. So, as I said, uh, um, three needs. We've been going back 15 years or so. And uh, as I like to say, the file service is the reason for the existence of the project, because that's the bit I work on, and it makes me feel important. Um, so we're still working on it. It's, it's amazing to discover that things that we thought we understood, um, you know, new variants of Windows come out, Vista taught us a few new things, um, they've just become incredibly interesting, and you know, we have to rewrite pieces of the code to get closer and closer to getting exact Windows semantics. Um, of course, you can never quite get there because you know, a new service pack will change things faster than you can get there. Um, but it's, it's amazing how much we still have to learn. I mean, we, we recently discovered a new wrinkle in the way Windows deletes files um, that actually isn't out in the current, current stable code branch but will be released in the next release that we're planning to do in March. Um, authentication service really started as something that we needed to do as part of the file service. And it was as simple as um, when Windows NT came out, uh, it had the ability to have security ownership on files, and we wanted to be able to show the Windows client who owns this file. And this led down a rabbit hole that has led all the way through Windows NT domain service and into Active Directory domain authentication believe it or not. Um, and printing, 
the original printing was nice and easy. It was basically copy a file to a share called print, you know, or a PRN um, device. Uh, so you would copy a file and then just send it onto the spooler. Uh, and then a lot of us started working for Hewlett Packard, who was very interested, obviously, in uh, selling ink. Uh, which, is, which is the main business. Remember, it's not the printers, it's the ink, which is more expensive than gold, I think. Um, so, uh, as HP likes to say, print more stuff. Um, so, they helped us work out how the point and print interface works, that is still uh, being used on all current Windows clients. Uh, and that was fun. Uh, we had a, a preliminary implementation um, that was done by uh, a Samba team member in France, Jean-Francois, uh, and we kind of said, oh yeah, this, this is working, it'll take us about three months to finish it. About ten person engineer years later, we had something that actually worked. So, uh, but by that time, HP had hired us all, so it didn't really matter. Um, so, talking about the file service, um, we think we understand most of what we see on the wire in terms of file service from Windows. There are a few things that are a little mysterious. Uh, there are actually still a few flags that are, uh, are undocumented that we're kind of interested in. Um, so, for example, some of the things that we don't do. Um, we've been looking at different ways to do this. Um, these, these are some of the weirder Windows-isms. One of them is open by iNode, which is essentially the ability to um, do a stat and file again by iNode and essentially opened by that rather than by path name. Um, we don't support that. Uh, I think that's to do with the search service that Windows uses, because uh, I think it indexes things by iNode and then opens them later on by that when you're doing a search. Um, that's something that we might get a little more interested in. The per file encryption and compression, um, we don't currently support that. Um, that's one of the, the stranger areas. It uh, might be useful to do so. Personally, I think having Unix having its own um, per file encryption and compression, uh, having an uh, compressed file system might be a little more useful uh, and just present the um, uncompressed file back to the Windows client. The separate data streams per file is very interesting. Um, how, how many people know, uh, have, have heard of separate data streams per file? Uh, so, not so many. So Windows has this very interesting feature that when you open a file by a name, if you add colon colon <coughs> on the end of it, you can actually uh, open or create a separate file within a file. So essentially each file acts as though it is a single level directory. Uh, this was actually used to bypass IIS security at one point, where somebody realized that if you actually requested to open a file, uh, and you prepended colon colon dollar data on the end of it, even if it was a file you weren't allowed to access, they were filtering by name, and the colon colon dollar data confused the, the filter and allowed you to open it. And that's the name of the main data stream within the file. Now, I originally was a big fan of doing separate data streams in the file, until I saw an absolutely terrifying paper on Windows security, which showed a virus hiding inside myfile.txt in a stream that was called colon colon virus.exe. And it turns out that the Windows uh, shell interpreter will actually execute something so long as it has the name .exe on the end of it, even if it's a stream name. So there was this utterly terrifying picture of the Windows task manager running showing the myfile.txt as a, a, as a running process. Uh, which, is, which is not something that most people would immediately flag as a problem. So, we, uh, currently I, I, I've flip-flopped on that and I've followed Ted Chill's advice on having separate data streams per file is a really bad idea. Um, the, the good thing about that is, for a while we were worried that we would have to support that because Windows was beginning to use it. But what, what has turned out is that because the internet has become so much more popular and transferring files on the internet has no way of encoding separate data streams per file, the use of that has essentially been curtailed. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we can ignore that. So POSIX, which is what Linux mostly implements uh, with a few additions and a few omissions, um, is good enough to actually most, to map most Windows file sharing semantics. 
um, supposite so locks, despite one horrible feature, are actually flexible enough to map Windows locks onto. The interesting thing is you can't map um, POSIX locks onto Windows locks, uh, which is why NFS clients on Windows really suck um, going against Windows servers, because they, no, they have no way um, from the Windows API to map the POSIX locks correctly. Um, and also, the popular Unixes, Linux and FreeBSD are starting to add some of the Windows style metadata into the file IOs, um, which actually makes our life somewhat easier in mapping the Windows semantics into um, POSIX and vice versa. Because the, the Windows I know is just chock full of stuff that normal POSIX doesn't have. Um, so, we have to live on, on the bleeding edge of, of the Linux and, and Unix non-standards, which means that I sometimes publish long and completely ignored rants about how evil and stupid the Unix vendors are. Um, so, uh, Apple's was a classic one. Um, uh, I'm, I think I actually managed to help get Apple's, POSIX Apple's into the Linux kernel. And this was by the simple expedient of, there was a, a POSIX Apple patch which was done by Andreas Grumbacher in Germany, uh, which was being ignored by the mainline Linux distributions. Um, but I, I really, really wanted to have POSIX Apple's in Samba uh, across all, all the different distros. So eventually what I did was I coded up POSIX Apples in Samba to the Solaris API and then published the code and then started saying on the Samba lists, oh well if you want a real file server that does Apples you have to use Solaris. And within a few months, um, strangely enough, the, uh, the Apple patch was sort of accepted into the Linux kernel. Um, so yeah, some, sometimes, sometimes the kernel people do listen to application, application space. Um, currently, we're, we're looking towards the NFS version 4 Apple model, which is actually a, a much closer match to Windows. Uh, note I say much closer match, I don't see an exact match. Um, because how, how many people here have actually read or, or played with the NFS v4 spec? Or, uh, okay, there's only two, two protocol geeks in the audience, never mind. Uh, anyway, so, so I'll, I'll just uh, give you a quick um, idea of what the NFS people did which was they wanted to make NFS more Windows friendly. So they decided that they were going to adopt their Apple model from Windows. But unfortunately what they did was they took the published specification <coughs> from Microsoft as the model of how the Apples were going to be done. And they put that into the NFS v4 spec. Now, unfortunately for them, it's very close, but it's not exactly what Windows does. Um, so, um, now we have sort of three incompatible Apple models. We have Windows Apples, we have POSIX Apples, and then we have NFS v4 Apples, which are nearly Windows Apples, but not, not close enough. Oh, and the, the other wonderful thing about NFS v4 Apples is they break POSIX semantics, which I don't think they understood when they put them in. Ah, but never mind. Um, so, other things that are being added are the birth time field in um, FreeBSD, which Apple is using, which is it's essentially the timestamp of when the file was created. A lot of people looking at the Unix um, stat map page see C time and they think that's create time. Uh, it isn't, it's change time. There's no way on Unix to tell when a file was actually created. Um, so birth time is, is, the, uh, is the new uh, me method of doing that. S um, sub second file timestamps. Uh, Windows actually counts timestamps in 100 nanosecond units from the year 160 something or other. Um, just in case you have a very old file, um, the loop table or something. Um, and so sub-second file, file timestamps are actually very useful. Um, and, and I mean one second sucks. So uh, that's, that's part of course of granularity. So that's now becoming added. And, and we're, adding, we're adding code in December to support that correctly. Um, another thing that we have that we got into Linux um, early and also into IREX, uh, none of the other Unix vendors picked this up, was file leasing, which is the ability for a kernel to guarantee to a process that you are the only opener of this file. <laughs> that means you can do in incredibly aggressive caching on the client. Uh, very useful for benchmarks, uh, as the NetBench benchmark shows. But the cool thing about NetBench is because uh, it uses opportunistic locking file leasing, 
you can actually get a throughput for your server that is faster than the physical capability of the network wire between the two. Because what you're actually measuring is client memory bandwidth. Um, so NFSV4 also needs file leasing, so there's a bed, much better chance that some of the other kernels that we need, that we run on, uh, are going to start supporting it and um, exporting it into user space. Uh, of course, the APIs that they all choose to export almost certainly will be completely different amongst every single Unix. But hey, that's just the Unix vendor's way of sitting in a circle bashing each other over the head. Like, uh, like, like the Kenobi, not like the KD versus Kenobi stuff. Uh, my my favourite joke about that is, because uh, I'm, uh, as you may notice, I'm quite old, so I'm a veteran of the original Motif versus Openlook wars. And the, my favourite joke about that is, who won in the war between uh, Motif and OpenLock? And the answer is Microsoft Windows, of course. Um, so I see the same thing happening with KD and GNOME. Well done, you guys. Um, more things we're using the uh, iNotify interface, which uh, I don't know whether you were in Andrew's Morton's talk yesterday. Someone asked a question about it. Uh, interestingly enough, the question he asked, iNotify is a method of opening a directory handle and being notified on any file change underneath that di in that directory. Interestingly enough, the question the, uh, that he asked was that he wanted hierarchical <coughs> notification is exactly something that Windows provides. You can actually open a high-level directory and you will be notified about any changes in the complete tree underneath it. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting that at least some application people want that. So, we've got iNotify, uh, there was an old Linux interface called dnotify, which was horrible, we're now using iNotify, which Volker just supported um, from time before. Um, we will, we're hoping that this will be adopted as standard across the other Unix vendors, but like I say, I don't know that much hope. Um, asynchronous I.O., uh, again, something that Andrew talked about. We currently, we try and support POSIX standards as much as possible, so our asynchronous I.O. code is actually built on top of the POSIX real-time A.I.O. standard. Uh, if we get a, a better version of that, we may end up building a compatibility layer and using that instead. Uh, it was really cool, but actually not very much used, because Windows clients would, would not pipeline reads or writes. They would do a read, wait for a response, do a write, wait for a response. They wouldn't fill the pipe. Our SMB client code was the only code that we knew of that would actually correctly pipeline reads and writes. Um, but we've got some early reports coming from the mailing list that Windows Vista actually does correct some async IO and will pipeline reads and writes. So that should make things much more interesting. Um, and the other thing is the notification mechanism for that. Um, both Linux and FreeBSD use an interface <coughs> called KEVENT. Uh, the great thing about KEvent is it's spelled exactly the same in both systems. The bad thing about KEvent is that it's completely different on both systems. So, well done, Linux vendors uh, and uh, uh, kernel vendors. So, what do we do about the pieces of Windows that just don't map very well to POSIX? Well, we, we emulate them essentially. I mean, this is this is the hard part of Samba. This is the at least to me the fun part is how to map these somewhat different window semantics onto a POSIX model. So we have to have mandatory file locking, because that's what Windows clients expect. Um, we have to have some very interesting delete and close semantics. Um, they're, they're kind of fun. So with Windows, uh, with, with POSIX, when you delete a file, it just disappears from a directory listing. It's gone. It doesn't matter how many other people have it open, it's just disappeared. Um, it will remain active until the last uh, opener has closed it, then it will go away. With Windows, the semantics are really interesting and different in that you can open a file multiple times and one of the openers can set a flag that says, please delete this on close. And at that point, no other opens are allowed, but the file remains in the directory listing until the last opener has closed, then it's deleted. So, I'm sorry? Yeah, there's all sorts of strange little restrictions that are actually part of the underlying windows. So Volker's comment was you can't do a stat on it. Yeah, there's all sorts of strange little restrictions underneath um, that, that are actually exposing the windows implementation, which is um, adds credence to my assertion that the SMB or SIFS is windows on wire. Um, 
Now, the interesting thing about that is we used to ignore it, but the problem is applications depend on it. I mean, they do. Uh, and the, the biggest and, and most wonderful offender on this is Microsoft Office, which does weird stuff that nothing else does. Microsoft Excel is probably the best test application for a file server I've ever seen because it does things that, that nothing else, you will never see anything else do. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's a very interesting application, actually. Um, so, um, let's see. NFS3 for, oh, uh, share modes, which is another Windows ism, um, which basically allows you to open a file and say, I don't want to let anyone else open this file while I have it open. Uh, I actually found out the history of share modes, if anyone's interested. The original creator of the SMB protocol was an IBM employee called Barry Feigenbaum. And at the last but one SIFS conference, we, and Andrew Tritch, the, uh, the clever part of Samba, who works for IBM, he actually, got, uh, he actually got Barry to fly out and give a talk about the original 1.0 SIFS protocol. And I basically went up and said, why did you do this to us? It's, it's the most horrible thing you could have ever done. And it, it turns out that um, when they were adding SMB to DOS 1.0, um, they realized that most applications weren't written to allow multiple file openings, i.e. a network file server. And they already had, you know, like five important applications that they didn't know how they would behave in a network environment. So they added share modes to make sure that the clients could exclusively open a file. Um, and, and because of this, back in, I think it was like 1982 or 1983, everything else has followed from that. Um, and, and of course, the, the fact that you can deny uh, other openers makes, is the main reason why clustered Samba or clustered SIF is extremely difficult. Um, but we actually think we've solved that problem now, or Trish does, but I'll talk about that in a little while. So the file serving code, um, I can proudly say, you know, I think it's probably the best tested part of Samba. Not that I'm great at writing test code, uh, but we actually have a torture suite, which is part of Samba 4. And the nice thing about that suite is it's run on every single jacket, um, on sort of like 20 or 30 different systems. So if you break something, you find out almost immediately. And like I say, people occasionally actually read the email that it sends. Not often, but you know. So we, we used to have a sort of a, a health state of Samba and I, I think we're broken on 13 platforms right now, but they're platforms that suck anyway. So, um, so here's, here's the new stuff, the, the fun stuff that I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on at the moment. Um, SIFS is in your future. So, um, is there anyone here who doesn't have uh, Windows desktops at all in your organization? Yes, virtual machines count as Windows clients. Sorry. Okay. I don't know who you work for, but, you know, can I have a job? Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, you're self-employed and you have no Windows. Ah, you live in your parents' basement. Ah, that doesn't count. I didn't have any Windows when I was living in my parents' basement either. No, no. Anyway, so everybody has Windows. Um... Everybody has Windows. You know, everybody's going to have Windows for the foreseeable future. Uh, and essentially, if the Linux desktop is going to thrive, uh, or going to survive even, or, or the Mac desktops, they're going to have to live in this world, right? So, you're an IT support guy, and somebody says to you, I want to put these Linux desktop clients in, uh, but they're going to need different servers, because Windows won't serve NFS. You're like, uh, no, I think we'll just roll out some more Windows, thank you very much. So, Essentially, SIFS is the protocol, SMB SIFS is the protocol that's going to go to the desktop. It just is. So it, it's our job, uh, really, in the Samba team and the Mac OS and, and the Linux clients, to make this as seamless as possible in a Windows environment, and also to fix Samba so that with Linux and Mac clients work a little better against Samba servers than they do against Windows servers. Because, hey, we have both sides of the code. We can do some interesting things. So, um, let's see. IBM has full-time engineers, Steve French, um, who's out working at Connectathon with me. This is where the sweatshirt comes from a couple of weeks ago. Full-time working on, on Linux SIFs. 
Um, Apple has a couple of people working full time. They came out, we all sat together. There are actually now four different client implementations. One of them hasn't been announced yet, so I'm not going to talk about it. But there are, there are four different SIFS client implementations that are starting to implement extensions to the SIFS protocol that have been defined to make Unix to Unix SIFS a little easier. Um, so we all collaborate, basically. And we own the servers and clients. Yes, question. Hooray! The first question. I, I wish I had a prize to give you because it's like. Uh, are you an organizer? An organizer, no. Oh, okay. Just sorry. Just, just wondered. Because, sorry, just to the side. The organizer has done a fantastic job. A really, really great conference. And I don't think you want to speak to anyone. So. <laughs> if I'm here, I, I, I just want to say thank you because this is a really, really great conference. Anyway, sorry. Back to your question. So the, the comment is, NFS really sucks very, very badly. Don't you think Samba is better? I agree. <laughs> in, in fact, I, I gave a, a talk at the NFS conference called SIFT to the Desktop or the Death of NFS, which they really <laughs> loved. They, they, they thought that was a great talk. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the goal is to make SIFTs the dominant desktop protocol. Is it going to dominate on the back end when you've got big Oracle Lion talking to, you know, NAS stuff? Almost certainly not. That will be NFS v4 or hopefully some more intelligent protocol. You know, hey, maybe AFS, who knows. But I think to the desktop uh, and, and in small clusters of machines, SIFS really has won that war and, and will continue to dominate. So what we really need to do is to make it work as, as well as we can in our own environments, even if there's no Windows there at all. So, Apple are adding the Unix extensions, and I'd like to pre-announce to them, but I think we've already said that publicly. Um, so, the goal for, for the Unix extensions with SIFS is essentially to modify it as little as possible, right? Because we don't own it, right? I mean, Microsoft is the, the company that's driving most of the, the changes to SIFS, but they did um, give away a small piece of the SIFS specs that was originally requested by SCO, and I'm talking about the original SCO, I'm not talking about current day SCO, which was Caldera. Um, so the original SCO designed some Unix extensions which HP also adopted. Um, and essentially the early design of it was, how do we do Unix stat and get the metadata that we need? So it's been since expanded, so it will do POSIX locking. So the amazing thing about this, and the thing that I, I'm, I'm really proud of, is we can run all of, with, with the current Linux kernel and a modern version of Samba, uh, we can run all of the current POSIX locking conformance tests, and we pass them all. I don't think NFS has ever done that. <laughs> Not in its wildest dreams has it ever done that. Um, so yes, we, we do all of POSIX locking completely correctly. Uh, we also have an on-the-wire method of getting and setting POSIX accuracy, um, which is, is pretty important, mainly in pure Linux environments. We also do Linux-style extended attributes. And while I was at Connectathon, we sat down and designed <coughs> and implemented um, POSIX variants for open, make data, and unlink. Uh, the interesting things about designing the SIFS extensions is working out how the POSIX calls interact with Windows specific calls when they're being done at the same time. And then the Mac guys really screwed me over by saying, oh yeah, and because we have Cocoa Carbon and, you know, whatever it is, you know, Cocoa Puffs sort of subsystems or whatever they've got running on their thing, we want to be able to do Windows calls and POSIX style calls on the same connection, sometimes to the same file. Oh, great. Uh, so that, that made it a little more interesting. So once we've got the code up and running in the best in the best form of RFCs, we're going to wait until the code works, then we're going to write down what we did. Um, and at that point, I'm, I'm hoping that we will have four clients. The, the three I can talk about are Mac OS X, Linux, and uh, HP UX has a, a SIS client. Um, there's a fourth one that will be coming out soon. Once those all support the Unix extensions, what I'm hoping is that the other two NAS vendors, which are basically EMC and NetApp, 
stop implementing that on their server side. I know NetApp is interested, uh, I'm not sure about EMC. Uh, we'll, know we've, we'll know we've won if, if sort of Longhorn server supports the Unix extensions, uh, extensions, but I'm, I'm not holding my breath. Um, so, a quick drink and then... Ah! I'm going too slow. So, um, authentication. So we started off essentially just wanting to authenticate the user, first by plain text, um, because you know, Windows, originally when we first started, Windows didn't really have any security, it was just a username and logged on, that was it. Uh, and then you had shell level security. Um, we originally adopted the Landmine Challenge with some help um, from a friendly engineer in, in Microsoft who should remain nameless. Um, the domain controller, the whole domain controller thing, just we, we didn't care, we weren't interested. But what happened was Windows NT came out and he had access control lists. And we really wanted to have access control lists because we knew we could do that in POSIX. It's a better map to our POSIX model. So we were able to give out access control lists. But as soon as we did that, what we found was that the Windows clients started making, as soon as we said, oh yeah, we support Windows Ackles, they started making all these other calls that we didn't understand. So a lot of work was done over many years, and we ended up with an implementation in Samba of a protocol called DCE, Distributed Computing Environment Remote Procedure Calls, to implement this. And once, once you essentially, once you've solved that part of the problem, you're like 50 or 60 percent of the way to doing the full domain control. So it was like, well, why not finish it? So that's, that was essentially what happened. That's how Samba became an NT4 domain controller. Because originally we were just a file server and we really didn't care. Now, in most enterprises, at least in the US, Active Directory has, has kind of taken over as an authentication source. So Samba 3 really gets deployed as a member server in an Active Directory environment. I'll talk about Samba 4 in a little while. So Winbind, how many people here are actually running Winbind? Ah, the rest of you suck. You should be. Um, all right, it's not easy for you to run Winbind right now. Uh, it's difficult to set up, but hey, that's Samba. That's you know one of the badges of honor if you get Samba branded on your forehead if you set it up correctly. Um, it's so, so the, just as an aside, the goal for Samba was like, we'll do you a great file server, and then someone can come along and make some money by doing really, really cool GUI administration tools. Unfortunately, nobody seemed to do that. <laughs> So, anyway, a few people have. Um, so Winbind is, is really the secret weapon of Samba. Winbind is, is a single sign-on agent. Uh, it, it allows um, Unix UIDs and GIDs to be mapped into Windows SIDs. Um, the cool thing about the code that will be coming out and has been tested in large-scale production systems is that it will handle offline authentication. So, here's the cool thing. You can take a Windows laptop, sorry, you can take a Linux laptop, you can join it to an Active Directory domain. You can say shut down or hibernate, close it, pull out the network cable, take it home, bring it up again, and log on using your cached credentials. And see the you and everything works. See the users, files, or whatever, or VPN in. Everything will just work. You go back to the office, you plug in again. It'll refresh your Kerberos credentials for you natively. Now, right now, the, the only Linux that has this is the Novell SUSE Linux desktop. Because um, that's where I was when we developed it. Now, uh, hopefully, it will be being added to a lot of the other Linux vendors. Um, <coughs> but it, it gives the complete single sign-on that you really need for interoperability. It's, it's incredibly cool. It does require a little bit of setup. So what I'm hoping is that as it gets integrated into other Linux vendors, and hopefully, I, I have my hopes, um, although I'm you know, not counting on it, I hopefully it gets put into Solaris and maybe FreeBSD, is that this will become a, a standard and will become essentially the single sign-on solution for Unix servers living in Windows networks. There's some problems, mainly because POSIX sucks. And the problems are scalability. So let me explain why. I don't know whether you've noticed, but sometime around after Windows 2000 shipped, all the interfaces in Windows for looking up a user or a group stopped being a drop-down list. 
The Gnome and KDE people still haven't got this. They still don't understand. The, the Acla editor was recently added to Nautilus. And when you want to add an entry to an Acla, you have to click on a, a drop down menu. And it expects to be able to show you every single possible user in <coughs> that drop down menu. Oh, great. Imagine that you're running in some of the environments that Active Directory runs. Active Directory is deployed in global networks where you have servers in you know, Canada, US, Europe, and Bangalore. <coughs> and the links between them are nasty wet pieces of string that go down often. So, uh, oh, and you have 150,000 users in the database. And that's not even counting the groups. So, now tell me how the drop down interface, but add an Apple. Oh, wait 30 minutes while I try and contact every domain controller in the entire world. This is not a scalable solution, it's not going to work. Windows has searchable interfaces for all of these things. You bring up an Apple editor in Windows now and you say, I want to add a user. It says, okay, here's a search box. Search for that user. And then it will actually do an efficient lookup. The problem with our environments, the Linux and Unix environments, is that we only have the POSIX interface. And the POSIX interface is dumb and old and expects to have cheap local lookups. That is no longer the case. So we have to do things like <coughs> the, the only interface for enumerating users, the searching for users, is to search through the entire list. The getGRNAMPL, which returns the group information, one of the things it returns to you is a list, a text-based list of every single user in that group. Mostly when you're making that call, you just don't care. You only want to know what's the group ID. So it's just incredibly efficient and badly designed for big global networks. This will have to be fixed. I don't know how we're going to fix this. It will probably be some collaboration with a lot of the Unix vendors, Apple, Sun, you know, the Linux vendors and the GLC people, but we have to have a better interface than this, because otherwise we're kind of broken. Oh, the other thing is Windows allows groups within groups, which is very important for very large networks. Um, so we actually have a feature in WinBinder where essentially it will unroll that into the full list of users for it. Um, but it's, it, it's a little clunky, so we, we kind of need better interfaces for that. So, what being a DC is, has changed a great deal since Windows XT4 came out. An Active Directory is really now mandatory. And, and that essentially is the goal of Sandra 4, is the primary thing is to be an Active Directory domain control. But it's very, very hard. So, you know, why is, why is Active Directory so difficult? Why hasn't it been done? Well, it's not just one protocol. If Active Directory was simply just doing LDAP, it would be done by now. Be patched to open LMAP, it would be finished. The problem is when Windows clients start talking to Active Directory, they say, I'm in an Active Directory domain, they will start doing, they won't just do one call, they will do a call to something called Connecting with LMAP, which we now have uh, implemented. Then once they get information from that, they'll do DNS queries. Then when they get information back from that, they'll start doing Kerberos queries. Tickets they get back from that, they will then pass into a DC RPC called tunnel over SMB. The information they get back from that, they will then use to do a straight DC or a TCP call. The information that comes back from that then starts getting fed into LDAP queries and then falls back to doing some more DNS. You get the idea. Any one of those steps fail, the whole thing fails. And the client says, I can't talk to the domain controller. This is not only active directory domain. Uh, you need the Active Directory Data Model and the Schema. Essentially, you have all these different components. They all have to talk to a common backend store. They all have to be completely integrated with each other. You come in and you change a password via LDAP, you have to see that in Kerberos. You come in and set an account restriction um, via DC RPC, query it via LDAP, you have to see that. Everything has to be seamless. Because that's the way the Windows clients expect it. So all of the components on the previous slide, they all exist in the free software world. I mean, pieces of them are, are everywhere. I think the uh, DC RPC code has now been released by as well, it's all out there. But they're not integrated. And integrating them together and making them look like that seamless whole is a very hard job. So one of the things that Samba 4 is doing is that 
they're trying to work out what, how the integration has to work, how the components have to fit together. Now, one of the ways that that's being done is by writing and replacing those components. So, the technical the Heimdall code <coughs> integrated that into the tree. The LDAP server is actually new code, it's not based on open LDAP. I'm, wasn't my decision that that's not one of my, I, I'm, I'm not too keen on that decision. I think in the long run, we will have to um, start using, start sharing code and start using other people's projects, but I'll talk about that in a little while. The DCRPC code is very clean, very nice. It's actually much nicer than the DCRPC code that was published by the Open Group. So I, I think we'll end up using our DCRPC code for that. So the goal is that eventually what we'll have is we'll have a Samba 4 Active Directory main controller because the file and print service aren't being worked on so much there with Samba 3 member servers. And then eventually we'll be able to migrate slowly forward. So it reduces the big bang effect of having to say, right, here's Samba 4, change everything. Everything you knew is wrong. All the books wrong. This way it allows us to say, okay, we're going to have an active directory domain control of the Samba 4, but you can leave all your member servers in place and they'll act in the same way. So, um, basically the problem of printing, um, thank, thank God Cux has won the printing API rule. It's sort of dominated all of the Unixes, which is great. Because at least it gives us one target that we have to write to. So printing these days is essentially just translating the Windows print primitives into Cux calls, which is a lot easier and nicer. Um, so the current Windows printing is built on an incredibly baroque set of DC RPC calls. Uh, I have a, a separate presentation I did a few years ago, sort of why printing sucks. Um, so I'll not go into that too deeply. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the um, Windows printing is that it actually is tied greatly into the registry. And so what this means is we need to have a Windows registry on the side. Are you going to make a comment? Oh, oh, oh five minutes. Oh, okay, I'm going to hurry up. Um, yeah, there's, there's some issues with, uh, there's some issues with um, printing. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Windows NT on alternate architectures like Alpha and PowerPC never made it. Because the printer driver, you, you think the Windows you know, display driver people are bad. The Windows printer driver people are, it's, it's some of the worst code in existence. Um, it will do things like it will set something via uh, a printing RPC call and then expect to read it out of the registry and the two things have to match. So this is, this is what led to the creation of the Samba registry, which I'll go into in a little bit. Mostly our code here just works. The only thing that gives us difficulty is what's called server-side rendering, where a client sends an EMF file, an enhanced metafile format file, over to the server and says to the server, here, you render this for me. Um, we were quite worried about that becoming a standard, uh, but it turns out that, I mean, this mechanism just sucks because what it does is it eats up CPU cycles on your servers. You know, so you've got this sort of two gigahertz <laughs> client sat there doing nothing but capturing key presses for Word and then you're pushing all your print rendering onto a completely overloaded server. So, they seem to have stepped back from that and they seem to be doing more client-side rendering. So, uh, quick aside for the fourth leg, which is kind of stuck off the side of the file service, which is the RPC transport. Um, so, it, it's kind of a hidden part of Windows. Uh, everything in Windows, everything remotely in Windows is done with DC RPC. Um, how many people have played with or know anything about Sun's ONC RPC? Oh, not so many. These, God, if I'd have asked this ten years ago, the whole room would have known. Anyway, uh, so I guess DC RPC really has one, which is a shame because there's a protocol. It sucks! It's horrible, horrible, nasty and disgusting. It's designed for the 1920s processes or whatever, when, when you know, having a network byte order format was so expensive that, you know, you can send the bytes in any format and you just set a flag to say whether it's big engine or little engine which means twice as much code on the server. It's horrible! Uh, anyway, uh, but it's very popular. Uh, Windows uses it a lot. Samba 3 right now only supports it tunneled over SMB and SIFs. 
uh, we will eventually need to support this over raw TCP. Samba 4 already does so, so we need to merge that code. Uh, Samba 3 has some handwritten marshalling code. Uh, the right way of doing RPC is to write a, what's called an IDL file, which describes the protocol, and then have that auto-generated via a, a, a programming tool into code. Um, because we were stupid, we did it by hand to start with, and we're finally getting rid of that. Uh, the nice thing about doing it by hand is that you can add in all the security checks that Windows didn't have, like, have we run off the end of the buffer yet? Have we run off the end of the buffer yet? Windows didn't bother with that originally. I think they do now. Uh, but it's horrible to maintain, horrible to extend. And we have finally got a proper auto-generated RPC code, uh, Piddle compiler for Perl-based IDL compiler uh, from Samba 4. So, here's an example, I don't know if you can see it, but it's actually the registry editor on Windows looking at a Samba box. Isn't that weird? Um, but there you can see it actually looking at the Postfix uh, SMTP mail service, uh, which is a process running on uh, a Samba server, and as you can see, uh, it looks pretty much like a Windows box, but it's actually working against Samba on Unix. Weird, huh? Very cool, though. So here's something else that I never thought would be done because it's so hard and disgusting. Um, but uh, a commercial company did this and donated the code. So here is the Windows performance monitor actually looking at a Linux box compiling Samba. Um, and giving you, and it, it's pulling the information out of slash proc and formatting it as registry data and sending it back via registry calls, which is how the, uh, how the uh, Windows performance monitor actually works. Um, but it's very handy. And uh, here's Samba acting as a universal uh, administration tool. So here is the postfix daemon being stopped via, or, or is it started? Started via the uh, Windows Service Control Manager. Now you laugh, right? But tell me, how many Windows admins in your organization would you trust to give root on your Linux service to do this? <laughs> They like this. They're used to this. You can control what they can do. It's very <laughs> So, let's get on to Samba 4. Now, as I like to describe Samba 4, it's like flying an aeroplane, dismantling it, and building another aeroplane, which is also flying at the same time as you're moving along. So, it's a bit complicated, and also you might crash a lot. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of fiddly. So where did Samba 4 come from what is it? Well, I like to refer to it as the research arm of Samba. So basically Tridge is smarter than the average bear and is looking at the Samba 3 code. And he finally got fed up with his grumpy crap code from 1991 and said, this stuff is garbage, I can do better than this, I'm going to do it again. So he did. It was originally started as a new VFS virtual file system interface that would match the Windows stance, the Windows semantics much better. And it just kind of grew. But it turned out to be a technology goldmine in terms of um, stuff that we can use in the production code. So it created Piddle, the IDL generated compiler, means that we replace thousands and thousands of lines of hand generated code with auto generated code, which is easier to make sure it's secure, it's a lot easier to change and fix, etc. Talak, uh, this is started to be used in other projects. It's essentially, as I like to call it, C without objects in a kind of a mean way, because I like C. Um, but it's a hierarchical memory allocator that allows you to use the C trick of um, resource allocation is initialization and destruction. So you can essentially destroy a whole hierarchy of objects by just destroying the top level context. Transactional TDB, this is going to be uh, and, uh, clustered TDB. This is going to be extremely important for clustered Samba, where you have multiple Samba heads across a distributed file system. Um, clustered TDB has got infinite band and gig, gig Ethernet uh, transports behind it. LDB, which is an LDAP search interface sat on top of TDB so that it solves the multi indexing problem that you have with a trivial database. And then Eventlib, which is essentially something that sits on top of all the different horrible methods of doing asynchronous event notification and makes it a nice, easy to use API. 
which actually handles signal to it. The, the problem is with most of the other, I asked Trish, I said, why did you not look at LibEvent or um, there's another one out there? And he basically said, none of them handle signals and they don't do it the right way. So um, he wrote his own, but he's kind of clever enough to do that. So, so what we're doing right now is Samba 4 is developing these things. As they become mature, you know, the, the people mainly working on Samba 3 sort of go, well, that's really cool, I'm going to steal that. So eventually, the idea is, and I think this is my next slide, and I'm running out of time here, sorry. Is it a fork? People say, oh, I've got a horrible fork. Yes, we have a horrible fork. It's true. It is a fork. But it's, a natural, it's actually a very official one. Because what it does is it allows new technologies, new ideas to be tried out in a way that we simply can't do with the production Samba code base. Unfortunately, Samba is too big in terms of the number of users out there. We just can't be as irresponsible as we really are. Um, we just can't break it in the way that we really like. So, so Samba 4 allows things to be weirdly messed up and broken. Um, and what we're, what we're trying to do is to convert the two code bases. So the goal is that we'll eventually ship a working active directory to make control with complete file and print service. And when we do that, we call Samba 4 complete. What that code will look like, I'm not sure yet. Probably some kind of horrible mutant hybrid with three heads of both branches merged together. It uh, probably won't look exactly like Samba 4 does now. It certainly won't look anything like Samba 3 does today. But hopefully it will be a lot better and more interesting and fun to work on the code base. So the, the questions remain about the AD uh, technology. I mean, do we merge with OpenLDAP? Do we use Handle or MIT Kerberos, which has kind of won the Kerberos wars out there? How do we integrate with the DNS and DHCP server, which we need to be able to do Active Directory properly? My, my, this is just my personal opinion, is that we're too small a group of programmers. There's probably five to ten really active people. We're too small to support all these protocols ourselves. Um, we need to merge with other open source projects. You know, I don't mind as being the glue that holds these things together, but I think we're too small to be open LDAP, Binds, you know, MIT, Kerberos, Samba, uh, and everything else all in one go. We, we, need to, we need to share stuff with these other, other folks. So, my uh, wonderful, also extruded mug um, challenges we face going forward. Windows isn't a static target because we had to have a Vista bug squashing day after Vista shipped. Because um, we, we were working, we thought, perfectly with Vista release candidate one, but they changed a few things between that and the release. So we needed to, uh, to have some patches put out there. So one of the interesting things <laughs> is SMB number two, um, which appears to be eating my file service. But, so SMB two is basically the new Microsoft, don't use this, use that, this is shiny and new file service protocol. Um, my, the way I like to describe that is, is at least the six, we've been on a treadmill that's been run by someone else for quite a while, and we finally stack it to the front, and we've got our hands on the throttle, and we can slow it down a bit, right? And so everyone's sort of, like, oh thank god, we're now walking at a steady pace, and then someone stands up there from Microsoft and saying, hey, but look at this treadmill, this one's new, you can watch CNN, look, it's, you, you can say, look, got a static, you know, um, Icon it, it's, it's got pictures, it's new, painted new, and sort of revs the throttle. And, and already I see a few of the NAS vendors going, oh, that treadmill, oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, maybe, maybe I should try running on that. So I'm, I'm hoping to essentially keep the old original SMB sits alive as long as possible. Um, the SMB2 essentially, Vista, when it talks to a, a SIT server, it adds SMB2 as a new supported protocol. And the if the server, if the new server replies, yes, I support that protocol, the entire conversation is different. It's, it's essentially, it's almost like you, you send out a sys packet, you get a response, and then you start sending NFS v4. It's, it's kind of like that. It's, it's different. It took Tridge and a few other people about six months to work it out. So uh, that was quite a while. Uh, but we do have a working client implementation. It wouldn't be too difficult to turn that into a server implementation. I'm guessing three to four months if we had to do a crash program on it. I'm hoping that we don't. Um, so there's SMB2 coming along. Uh, there's always new Active Directory calls and some interesting wrinkles coming along in the authentication piece. 
Um, I can't talk too much about that, um, but it, it, this just let's just say the, the client and server are pretty closely tied together. So as the clients rev, the servers rev, and interesting things turn up. And the other thing is the server-side print rendering. Server-side print rendering is interesting because it depends on Windows DLLs being loaded from the client onto the server when you install a printer and being run as Windows processors on the server. We can't do that. So server-side rendering is, is a, a, a big threat for us. I, I, for, this, for this talk, I went over and I looked at the new uh, XPS and uh, EMF. Uh, no, it's XPS is the new print service in, in this year. And I couldn't see anything that made it depend on server-side rendering. So I think it's a new way of doing the rendering in the client. It's a whole new print engine. But I think when it comes down to it, at least in the parts that we care about, which is a network protocol, it's simply the, a, new, a new set of rendering on the client, but the same old packets going over the wire. So I'm not too worried about that right now. Although I, I may get panicked calls from HP saying, oh my god, we need to sell more ink. This is it's not working with Thunder. Um, so, so coming soon, uh, one of the interesting things about Sandra is it seems, at least our own treadmill, the development treadmill, we seem to be accelerating as we go along. Um, so clustered Sandra is currently being designed and coded up by Tridge as a test base in Sandra 4. It will probably be backported to Sandra 3 with, with some interesting changes. Um, what it allows is for multiple Sandra servers on separate machines to share a common distributed file system running over a SAN or something similar, and all of those servers to provide exact Windows semantics. So that's, you know, a, a client opening a Word file on one server will be seen as an open Word file on another server. And one of the IBM guys at Samba XP last year did a brilliant demo using VMware on a machine much more powerful than mine to show um, OpenOffice from a Linux client connecting to one server and um, a Windows client using Microsoft uh, Office connecting to another Samba server and opening the same file on a, dis on a third server all running on his laptop. He had a beefy laptop uh, on a distributed file system and each of the programs could see the others open. You got the familiar, this file is being opened by another user, do you want to wait until they close it? And it all worked across one, two, three, four, five machines, which was pretty cool. Um, another thing that we really need to have, because of the, my one buzzword on this slide is virtualization. <coughs> um, what does that mean? Anyway, um, we need to be able to, to me, what virtualization means is when you previously had to manage 300 servers, now you've got to manage 3,000, uh, which are the same crappy tools. Um, just, just as a question, I asked this in, in England, how many, how many people have actually lost a virtualized server? Like, just mislaid it. <laughs> I, I managed to do that. I, I, I was remote and I had a bunch of virtual IBM yeah, virtual machines running, and I lost a Windows 2000 RC2 server. I, just, I knew it was on the network, I knew it was, you know, I, I knew it was on one of my IP addresses, I just couldn't remember where it was. So I ended up having to basically scan the address space until something responded to SIFS ping. Like, oh, my, oh, that's where it is. Yeah. Uh, so virtualization is going to suck, I think, um, for management. Um, so we, we need to jump on the buzzword wagon, buzzword bandwagon, and make Samba very friendly for virtualization. And that means being able to deploy a Samba server from a virtual machine and have it pick up its SMB.com. Oh, well, I've got to finish. Pick up its SMB.com. Uh, we also need encrypted SIFs because NFL ha NFSV4 has encrypted transport and we have to be better, or at least as good. Uh, and we're going to do group policies as uh, soon as we work out what they mean in a uh, Linux world. So anyone who does Windows admin will, will love us because they love group policies. Okay, so I came here 10 minutes over time. So are there any questions that you didn't want to ask during the talk and you want to ask now? Questions, comments? Yes? So the question was, are there any benefits in SMB2 or Microsoft in making life difficult? Um, SMB2 does have things like transaction support and it also has 32-bit reads and writes. 
And the benefits claimed on the website are that it you know, is great in, low, uh, in, in large latency connections. So it would be fantastic. So Trips decided to actually test this. So he, he brought up Windows Explorer and made a connection, you know, looking at a standard directory, made a connection via SMB, and he counted the packets. And then he did the same thing with Vista, doing SMB2 on the same directory. And the number of round trips to the server is twice as many with SMB2. So I, I think you can decide what that means in terms of how well it will work on high latency links. Um, does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Or people are quitting. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Volker. Uh, good point, Volker. Um, we have a conference coming up. If you're very interested in Samba and you want to get involved in the development, we have the worldwide Samba conference coming up, which is in Göttingen, in Germany, on April the 23rd to the 25th. So uh, go to sambaxp.org. At sambaxp.com or .org, I can't remember. Just do a Google search for sambaxp and you'll find it there. So, uh, any other questions? Or... Alright, thanks very much.